There. You got it. There's a reason for that verse. Today I'm going to go through the journey that I went through with, to become a Christian. And uh, it's, it was something that uh, was quite, I was quite impressed with some of the things that I'm going to mention. But uh, when I was uh, a young man, I was originally in the Baptist church, all of our family was. With 10 kids, you can imagine we filled up one pew and part of the other. It was a lot of us. <laughs> and uh, one of the congregation's goals at that time was to memorize the Ten Commandments. So uh, back then I could do it really well. Right now I can't, but we can read, read them off. Uh, the first commandment was, uh, you shall have no other God before me. You shall not make a graven image and, as an idol. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The fifth one says, honor your father or your mother. Uh, six, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not uh, bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet. Most of us know it as thou shalt not covet etc. King James Version. Uh, the fourth commandment was the one that uh, interested me when I was back there as a young man. Because the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And uh, this is where it all began, my story, with uh, venturing out and trying to find out uh, why was this verse saying what it says and yet we were not doing what it said to do. That was the beginning. You know, that's one of the things about doubt. Once there's a doubt, if you leave it, doubt will, uh, will kill faith. And in this case, my faith in what I was being taught was slowly starting to erode. Uh, I had neighbors back then that were Seventh-day Adventists. And as you know, Seventh-day Adventists meet on Saturday. If you didn't, well, you do know now. And so... <laughs> They always invited us to go to church with them, but of course we were members of this church and why would we go to that church? But we said, yeah, we want to go. So we went, we went to church with them and what we saw, I'm sorry, I should have gone back, shouldn't have gone forward yet. And while I was in that church service, what I saw was, uh, in my mind I was thinking, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And I said, you know, these people are doing that. They're actually doing that. And we, who were in uh, the other church, claimed to obey the Ten Commandments. And I said, but we aren't doing it. So that was uh, something that uh, didn't jive or didn't match. And then when I was around 12 years old, uh, I asked the preacher, if we keep the Ten Commandments, then how come we don't uh, meet on, how can we meet on Sundays? And his answer simply was, he says, oh, well, the Sabbath changed, you know, a lot of hand-waving. The Sabbath changed. No Bible. But he waved his hand and said, the Sabbath changed. And uh, I don't know where I'm supposed to point this thing at. Okay. Something happened here. Can, uh, can you help me with this? How come it's not changing? Oh, there, Gwent. For some reason, I went the other way. Okay. The Sabbath changed. And I said, the Bible doesn't say that. In my mind, I said, the Bible doesn't say that the Sabbath changed. Something changed, yes, but it wasn't the Sabbath. All right. I'm gonna, can you help me with this? Or, oh, it did change. It's not changing, I guess, when I'm thinking it is. There, all right, sorry about that. So not long after this question that I made to the preacher, I, my sister, whose name is Annabelle. My sister Annabelle was baptized. And uh, the preacher asked me, when was your sister uh, saved? And uh, again, what's happening? There. Then the preacher told me, well, I said, she was saved after she was baptized. And the preacher told me uh, that baptism wasn't necessary for salvation. He says, it was only an outward expression of an inward grace. And uh, 
There we go. So during those days, at that time when my sister was baptized, we were studying the book of Acts. And I saw that in the book of Acts, every time someone was saved, was, was, uh, saved they were baptized. And so I said, something is not correlating between the uh, teachings that I'm having. Okay, there we go. So something didn't match. And then when I got to high school, someone asked me, hey, because at that point, when he told me that baptism wasn't necessary and we were reading Acts and everybody was being baptized, I actually stopped going to that church. I stopped. I told my mom, I'm not going anymore. I says, they're not doing what the Bible says. Mom was a Sunday school teacher. And I said, no, I'm not going. I said, that, that's not right. So when I got to high school, someone asked me the question, do you believe in God? Okay, something, where am I supposed to point? Up there. Okay. They are definitely having problems. I'm about to leave this uh, screen. So they asked me, how were you saved? And I said, by faith. And uh, so I was asked if I had ever been baptized. And of course, the, I, ha I hadn't. My sister was baptized, but I had never been baptized. And afterwards, they began to teach me the gospel. They began to teach me about how to become saved in Christ. Okay. Oh, I'm definitely having problems with this. I don't know if it's the batteries or it's me or what, but I'm about to leave this if it doesn't. Hey, Jonathan, you're pushing both buttons at the same time. Stick Maybe. To the right or stick to the left and it'll work both. Okay. One button. There. Okay. So as we started to study the Bible, what I was most impressed with was that this person, every time they showed me something, they went to the Bible, they went to a book, a chapter, and a verse. Remember the preacher? No, oh, you don't have to be baptized. No hand waving. They showed me with book, chapter, and verse every time they had to something they had to uh, they wanted to show me. Again, my sister's baptism always comes back because because that was a pivotal point in my faith that I was starting to build. I remembered Matthew 28, 19, talking about baptism. It says, uh, go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I even felt pretty good about it because I could uh, cite that verse. You know, and I felt pretty good. You know, it's like speaking to someone of another church. Uh, then they asked me, have you ever read Mark 16, 15, and 16? And I'm, I'm sure I had. I said, yes, I have. And then we read it. We read the verse. And it said, And Jesus said to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I said, That's what Matthew 28, 19 says. And then it said, Let's read the next verse. And the next verse says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now there was a condition for salvation beyond just believing. And it wasn't, I, a preacher from some church that said it. It was Jesus himself. And Jesus said, he who is baptized, uh, he who believes and is baptized. Now there's two things that are tied together. It's not one without the other. It has to be both. And so this person began to teach me things. Uh, again, I keep going back to the baptism because now this goes back to what I was taught about what happened with my sister versus what the Bible says in Mark chapter 16. Uh, the teaching that I had from that preacher didn't match what Mark 16, uh, 16 says. So I began to uh, say there's, again, the doubt was there already, but now that's when I began to study more. Now I'm talking about study. The Bible, going in, trying to take note of book and chapter and verse. So I started to learn, uh, look differently at how I approach things. Uh, another new thing that I was taught was how to read the context. What's the context of a verse? Because, uh, you know, the context means, well, the whole text. What is it talking about versus picking out one verse? 
And so they taught me there was a difference. They said, read some verses before, read some verses after, and you'll get a better understanding of what the, the particular verse you're talking about uh, is, is looking at. So in Acts chapter 16, and, and actually Sean gave this example last week, Acts chapter 16, we looked at that, and it says, and he brought them out, uh, if that is the Philippian jailer, brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your family, and you'll be saved. And so if you go with that, then you say, hey, that's all I need to do. That's what he told the jailer, just believe. But again, the people that were, that were showing me, that person said, let's read the next uh, couple of verses or about that. And then, and actually this is, uh, let's read. Then they spoke to the word of Lord to him and said to all who were in the house, and the jailer took them that same hour of the night and washed their whip stripes, and immediately he and his family were baptized. Now that completes the story. If you go by just believe it and you'll be saved, then you're done. But if you keep reading, yeah, that is what you find, that there was more to the story than just that. And the same thing happened, for example, Mark 16, 16. Remember, he that believes and is baptized. That completes the story that Matthew 28, 19 started. That says, go into all the nations and teach all, go into the world, teach all nations. And baptizing them. And then Mark 16 uh, ties it up by saying, he that believes and is baptized. So as I saw that, and I saw about the, I thought about the Philippian jailer, and I said, you know, they actually were obeying, what? The word of God, whereas oftentimes men are, are obeying the, the word of men. And so there's a difference between commandments of God and commandments of men. And here's where I began to see there was, there was uh, something amiss for sure, and that uh, the ultimate authority that I needed to obey was the word of God. Remember I asked the preacher about uh, the Sabbath. And I said, isn't that one of the Ten Commandments? And this was one more piece of the puzzle as I was seeing the differences between the churches. So that's what I call this section is another piece of the puzzle. Uh, I asked the person who was teaching me then, I says, uh, what about this, the commandments and the obeying of the Sabbath? And the answer was that the church, that when Christ died, all of that, meaning the law and the Old Testaments and the rules therein, went away because Jesus had established his own church as the new means of being saved. And then he cited Matthew 16, 18. How many of us know that one by, by, by memory? And I say unto you, thou art Peter, a rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. I will build my church, they said. When Jesus was alive, they said, the church was coming. It wasn't here yet. It was coming. But after he died, we, we, all, we investigated verses and saw that the church was in existence. So where was the turning point? It was when he died. But he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, and then we read Hebrews 10.9, when, when he said, speaking of Jesus, Behold, I have come to do the will, thy will, O God. He takes away the first that he might establish the second. And that's when I say, wait a minute, what's this first and second? And he says, well, remember we talked about the Old Testament and we talked about Christ's church. They, they said, the Old Testament is the first part that he takes away and the second he established his church. And so here's a whole text that uh, talks about this in Hebrews 10. He says, but the Holy Spirit also witnessed to us. And there's going to be a lot of texts, okay? You've already seen that. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with, the, with them after, after those days, says the Lord. I will get, put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. This is a direct reference to the tablets of stone where God previously wrote laws. He said, this time I'm going to write them in their hearts. So that I started to see more and more changes 
as far as how the Bible teaches about Jesus and the church versus what I had been mistakenly taught before. And he goes on, he says, then he says in verse uh, 17, then he adds, the sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of sins, there is no longer an offering for sins. And there's another reference of the end of the uh, offerings for sin in the Old Testament. Every, uh, every day there were sin offerings, and once a year for the whole, ch uh, for the whole co uh, congregation of Israel. And I remembered that stuff, and then I said, but this says there, there's no more. But if, if, uh, if you actually read, this text comes from Jeremiah 31, 33, 34, verses 16, 17, and 18. He's actually citing from the book of Jeremiah. And if you get the first piece of that text, 31 through 34, here's 31 and 32, he says, uh, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the days I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Aha! There it is. He's talking about the law of Moses, that law that... Uh, that uh, was established. He says, my covenant which they broke. And I said, what? I said, Israel, aren't they the people of God? And as I was taught in the church that I was in before, he said, they broke the covenant. They broke it. He said, therefore, there was a need for a new one. And you keep reading. He says, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So, this is the whole text altogether. We, uh, we don't need to read that. This is actually the second part that we already read. Then they, we went to the next text, Hebrews 9.15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. And you know, more, the more we talk, the more I saw second or new. What was coming or what is, is new. It was not the Old Testament, and that's one of the things they told me. Remember the designation Old Testament and New Testament? I said, that's what it's all about. The Old Testament has to do with things of old when God took them out of Egypt, and the New Testament has to do with what Christ established when he says, I will build my church. And it started to make sense. He says, for, the, for redemption of the transgression and under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So when Jesus died, God put him as the new high priest. And the Bible says where the forerunner has entered into, uh, for us, even Jesus having become the high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is now the high priest. But again, if you remember uh, what was in the Old Testament, only ones that could be high priests were the sons of Aaron. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. Even I knew that back then. And I said, uh, there's definitely a change. And that's when they read me Hebrews 7, 12. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. There was definitely a new priest. And so there was also a new law. Again, this is just all getting back to why aren't we obeying the Ten Commandments? This is what this is all getting at. And uh, then I, I saw that. The Old Testament law had been taken away because Christ was the new high priest. And now it's Christ's law through his church that reigns. reigns. And that's what I was clearly and more clearly beginning to see and understand. Again, do you remember uh, the question about the Sabbath? The person who was studying me gave me a single verse to tell me when the church gathered. Acts 20, verse 7. A single verse. It says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. And so I said, okay, that's, that's good enough for me. From everything I had seen, I said, that's good enough for me. And then this was the last piece of the puzzle as to the differences that I saw between the churches, where I was versus what I was studying now with this uh, Christian. It says, during all of this, there was also an old man 
in the church where I was before. He always said, uh, it's impossible for you to uh, be lost once you're saved. He always said that. Always said that. And I asked about that. Okay. Because he always cited John 10, 28. And it says, and I gave them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. He said, it's impossible for someone to take you out of God's hand once you're saved. And so when asked about that, they gave me a couple of verses that I remember particularly. One was 2 Timothy 4, verses 9 and 10, where the Bible says, Be diligent to come to me, he says, quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved the world, this present world, and has departed from Thessalonica. Here's, a, here's a, a brother who deserted the faith and physically left Paul and went elsewhere. And I said, well, that's pretty serious. That's pretty serious. And then we did get the, the, they showed me the text of Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. In Galatians, there was a problem with as far as circumcision. They were, the uh, brethren wanted the, uh, the Judaizing brethren, the, a lot of those that came from Judaism, wanted the, all the members to be circumcised. In other words, to still keep the Mosaic law. And the Apostle Paul addresses this in this letter, and he says, Stand fast, therefore, uh, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, he says, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage, talking about the law of Moses. It was a law that no man could keep, that every man would ultimately break, except for Jesus. Indeed, he says, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. What he's saying is, if you were with Christ, and if you become circumcised to obey that law, then you're no longer with Christ. Christ will profit you nothing. In verse 3, And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Again, a law which no man could ever keep completely. You have become severed, the American Standard Version says. You have become severed or cut off from Christ you who attempt to be justified by law. And then the last piece of this says, you have fallen from grace. I remember later on, I was studying with some guys from uh, the same basic faith that I was in at before. And, I, and we read this. And I says, doesn't that say that you can fall from grace and no longer be part of Christ? Because it says you're severed from Christ. And one, there was three of them. One, the one guy says, yeah, that is what it says. And the other two says, oh, be quiet. You don't know anything. <laughs> but well, one guy saw it. Hopefully he kept seeing it after that. Because it's exactly what it says. And so with all of this, the only thing left for me to do was to be baptized and to be forgiven of my sin. I did a lot of, I like book, chapter, and verse. In my, in, all throughout my school, I, they called me a bookworm. I loved reading. And these are the texts that all this journey that I'm speaking of is what it what took me to finally being convinced that Christ Church, we, the name is Church of Christ, but it, it is Christ Church. That's what it is. The doctrine is there. The truth is there. So the only thing I can say is if this helps you and helps to convince you that you're on the right path, I would encourage you to continue on that path. I would encourage you to use book, chapter, and verse, which is what impressed me more than anything about the whole journey I took. That there was, it wasn't hand-waving. That, oh, yeah, yeah but no, no Bible. No, it wasn't that. Book, chapter, and verse. And I was convinced. Uh, and the only thing I can say with that is, and God bless you, and if this helps you, I hope that you would come to Christ if you haven't already. Uh, God has a plan of salvation. We've talked about it before. He, you have to hear the gospel. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, you got you to believe. Mark 16, 15, and 16 says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who believes not shall be damned or condemned. You have to repent. Luke 13, 3 says, Except I say unto you, Nay, unless you repent, you all shall likewise perish. Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you have to confess Christ. Matthew 10, 32 and 33 says, If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. But he also says in the next verse, If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father, who is in heaven. And you have to be baptized. Again, Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Go and teach all nations and baptize them. Mark said they have to believe and be baptized. We just cited Acts chapter 2, verse 38 that you become baptized and you get your forgiveness of sins. And remember, Jesus loves you above all. So if any of this helps you, uh, may God uh, bless you. And if there's anything I could do or any one of the members can help you in your journey to come to know Christ better and through his word, we ask that you uh, do so. Let us know. Come forward if you would. And we will uh, pray for you and help you with your spiritual needs. Thank you. God bless you.